Okay, welcome to The Crucible, Act 1, by Arthur Miller. I'm Mr. C, and I'm going to be your director through this uh, series of videos about The Crucible. One thing you need to understand about this is that if you're having trouble with it, it's okay. All right. There's a reason you're having a bit of trouble. There's a couple reasons. Uh, for one, the language is a bit antiquated. All right. it's, it's old. Okay, so some of the terms you're probably not going to be familiar with. Uh, another reason is that it's a play. And plays are meant to be seen, not so much read. That's one of the reasons people have so much trouble with Shakespeare. It was never meant to be read. It was meant to be performed. Okay, so some of the understanding can be lost if you don't have actors in front of you acting out what it is that the playwright had in mind. So if you're having trouble with it, don't fret too much, okay? Hopefully these, uh, this series of videos will help you uh, to you know, further understand the material. Because uh, if you don't understand it, you can't really invest yourself in the story. And it's a good story, and I'd, I'd hate for you to, to not enjoy it because uh, there's some, some difficulty with it. One thing you need to understand about, these, uh, about this uh, series, this will not be the entire Act 1. Uh, and that goes for Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, and Act 4 of this video series. It's not the whole act. You still have to read it. Sorry, guys. You still have to read it, okay? But it's kind of, uh, it's either hitting the highlights of each act or it's getting you started in each act so that you can, you know, again, further your understanding of the material in front of you. If you continue to have problems, come see me. Uh, I'll do what I can to sort of clear things up for you, but you do have to read the play. Okay? So, without any further ado, Act One of The Crucible. Now, the play opens up with, well, let me get Abigail out of there. The play opens up with Betty, Betty Paris, she is in bed, and there's something wrong with Betty. She won't wake up. Her father, Reverend Paris, is standing over her bed, praying over her. And there is, he is very, very worried. Uh, but we're going to come to find out that he's not only worried because his daughter is sick. So uh, Reverend Paris uh, already is not exactly a likable person. He's more concerned with his station in the town, with him being the preacher and being afraid of what people think of him because of his daughter, than he is that his daughter is sick. Okay? So, I hope you enjoy it. If you have any further questions, like I said, come see me. Uh, when you get to Act 2, definitely come see me and uh, you'll uh, be able to view the Act 2 clip. Alright? Hope this helps. My Betty be hearty soon. Get out. Get out. My Betty not going to die. She's not going to die. Get out of my sight. Uncle. Susan Walcott's here from Dr. Griggs. Ah, uh, okay, Abigail. Let her come. Let her come. Susanna, come in. What does the doctor say, child? He bid me come and tell you, Reverend Sir, that he cannot discover no medicine for it in his books. Then he must keep searching. But he bid me tell you, you might look to unnatural causes for the cause of it. No, no, there be no unnatural cause here. Tell him I have sent for Reverend Hale of Beverly, and Mr. Hale will surely confirm that. Let him look to medicine and put out all thought of unnatural causes here. There be none. Aye, sir. He bid me tell you. Susanna, speak nothing of this in the village. Yes. Go directly home and speak nothing of unnatural causes. Aye, sir. I pray for her. Uncle, the rumor of witchcraft is about. I think you best to go down and deny it yourself. The parlor's packed with people, sir. I can sit with her. And say what to them? That my daughter, my niece, 
I discovered dancing like heathens in the forest. Okay, now the play just opened up and he's talking about people dancing in the forest. So obviously this had happened before the play begins. What that's called is antecedent action. Act one, the opening of the play takes place in Betty's bedroom. But we're given information about something that happened before. So what is that? Well, they were in the forest and Reverend Paris was walking by and he heard some commotion. And so he hid behind a tree to see what was going on. What does he see? He sees girls dancing around a fire and Tatuba, his house slave from Barbados, over a boiling cauldron in the fire. And he sits and he waits and he watches the girls dance and he's thinking, oh, there's some girls going to be in trouble. I am the preacher and I am telling their parents they are going to receive a whooping and I... Whoa, that's my niece. That's my niece. Oh, she is going to get a whooping. She's going to get a whooping. And the girls continue to dance. And who comes into his sight but his own daughter? That's my daughter. And he jumps out of the, out of the bushes. And he screams, what are you doing? And Betty sees her dad, and she drops out. And they can't get her to wake up. And that brings us to Act One. So, and what shall I say then? That my daughter and my niece I discovered dancing in the forest like heathens? Uncle, we did dance. Let you tell them I confessed it, and I'll be whipped if I must be. But they're speaking of witchcraft. Betty's not witched. We did dance, Uncle, and when you leapt out of the bush so suddenly, Betty was frightened. Then she fainted. And there's the whole of it. I would never hurt Betty. I love her dearly. Now look, you child. Your punishment will come in this time, but if you've trafficked with spirits in the forest, I must know of it now. For surely my enemies will, and they will ruin me with it. But we never conjured spirits. Then why will she not move since last night? Abigail, do you understand that I have enemies? I have heard of it, uncle. There is a faction in this sworn town to drive me from my pulpit. Do you understand that? Now, then in the midst of this disruption, my own household is discovered to be the very center of obscene practice, abominations done in the forest. Uncle, it were only sport. I saw Tatuba waving her arms over the flames when I came on you. Why was she doing that? And I heard a screeching and gibberish coming from her mouth. She always sings her Barbados songs, and we dance. There's nothing more in it, I swear, Uncle. Abigail, if there is any other cause than you have told me for your being discharged from Goody Proctor's service, I have heard it said, and I tell you as I heard it, that she comes so rarely to church this year, for she will not sit close to something spoiled. What signified that remark? She hates me. She must, for I would not be her slave. It's a bitter woman, a lying, cold, sniveling woman, and I will not work for such a woman. They want slaves, not such as I. My name is good in the village. I will not have it said my name is soiled. Goody Proctor is a gossiping liar. Why, Goody Putnam, come in. It's a marvel. It's surely a stroke of hell upon you. No, Goody Proctor, no. It's, how high did she fly? How high? No, she never flew. She never flew. Why, it's sure she did. Mr. Collins saw her going over Ingleson's barn and come down light as a feather, light as a bird, he says. Now look, you goody Putnam. She never, oh, good morning, Thomas, Mr. Putnam. Hmm, it's a providence this thing is out now. A providence? What's out, sir? What? Hmm, why... Her eyes is closed. Look, you, Anne. 
Hey, well, that's strange. Ours is open. What? Your Ruth? Your Ruth is sick? I'll not call it sick. Tis the devil's touch and heavier than sick. It's death, you know. It's death driving into them forked and hooved. Oh, pray not. Why does Ruth ill? She never waked this morning, but her eyes open, and she walks, but hears not, sees not, and cannot eat. Her soul is taken away, surely. They say you've sent for Reverend Hale, Beverly, a precaution only. He has much experience in demonic, art, demonic arts, and I, he certainly has, and found a witch in Beverly last year. Let me remind you of that. Oh, goody Anne, they only thought there were a witch. And I'm certain there be no element of witchcraft here. No witchcraft? Now look you, Mr. Paris. Thomas, Thomas, I pray you leap not to witchcraft. I know that you, you least of all, Thomas, would ever wish so disastrous a charge laid upon me. We cannot leap to witchcraft. They, they would howl me out of Salem for such corruption in my house. Now, Mr. Paris, I have taken your part in all contention here, and I would continue, but I cannot if you hold back this. There are hurtful, vengeful spirits laying hands on these children. But, Thomas, you, you cannot. Anne, tell Mr. Paris what you have done. Reverend Paris, I have laid seven babies unbaptized in the earth, believe me, sir. You never saw more hearty babies born, and yet each would wither in my arms the very night of their birth. I have spoken nothing, but my heart has clamored intimations, and now this year my Ruth, my only, I see turning strange, a secret child she has become this year, and shrivels like the sucking mouth were pulled on her life too. And so I thought to send her to your Tatuba. To Tatuba? What made Tituba? Tituba knows how to speak to the dead, Mr. Paris. Goody Anne, it is a formidable sin to conjure up the dead. Aye, but who else may surely tell us who performed murder on my babies? Woman, they were murdered bears. And mark this proof, mark it. Last night, my Ruth were ever so close to their spirits. I know, sir, for how else is she struck dumb now, except some power of darkness would stop her mouth? It is a marvelous sign, Mr. Paris. Do you understand it? There is a murdering witch among us, bound to keep herself in the dark. Let your enemies make of it what they will. You cannot blink it more. Then you were conjuring spirits last night, Abigail? Not I, Tituba and Ruth. Now I am done for. You are not done for. Let me take hold here, and you take hold here. Wait for no one to charge you. Declare it yourself, you have discovered witchcraft. In my house, in my house, Thomas, they will topple me with this. They will make of it a scandal. 